Now, thank you, uh, GCSP and partners, for inviting me uh, to this interesting forum. Let me address uh, your questions in reverse order, uh, please, because if I start with JCPOA, I won't uh, have time for anything else in my allotted 10 minutes. Uh, so the November conference. Uh, when this uh, was postponed last year over COVID, I I'm sure that a lot of um, uh, supporters of the conference hoped that uh, postponing it to 2021 20, uh, would see a more supportive uh, uh, U.S. Um, approach that they would, you know, maybe willing to break with uh, Israel. Yeah, and certainly the the Biden administration is uh, much more uh, multilateralist, uh, and it believes in the efficacy of diplomacy. It's concerned about um, um, uh, this issue um, and would like to see a WMD free zone in the Middle East. But um, this probably won't make the administration break with Israel's posture toward the November conference. I mean, their, their rhetoric won't be hostile, like frankly it was uh, under the last administration. But the long and short, I don't think the Biden administration is going to send anybody uh, to the November uh, conference uh, as long as Israel doesn't. And Sharon will tell us uh, uh, about that. Um, the reason is because there's there's not that much benefit uh, to the United States, and there are real costs in breaking uh, with Israel's posture. And it's because Biden has you know so many other, frankly, more important issues uh, with Israel, starting with Iran, but also settlements. And you know why throw something into the mix that uh, isn't that really important? You know, if 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 Biden could say that he's just reverting to what Obama did, that would be fine. But this November conference is different from the series of, of uh, events that uh, took place uh, the last time, you know, when Finnish ambassador Yako Laeva uh, structured talks in a way that um, balanced the interests of all the parties. The difference this time, you know, is that the conference is being held as a UN event. Uh, previously, um, the talks that Laeva um, arranged in, in, uh, in Switzerland and in which Israel participated were not under the auspices of the UN and that's very important for Israel. And because it's important for Israel, it's going to be important for the United States. Uh, second issue, um, Israel-Palestinian talks. Um, first of all, President Biden certainly wants to repair the um, relations with the Palestinians that became so fr frayed uh, the last four years. When um, Joe Biden hosted Israeli Prime Minister uh, um, uh, Bennett, uh, Naftali Bennett on Friday, uh, Biden said that he intends to reopen the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem uh, that will provide uh, consular services uh, to Palestinians. Biden expressed his opposition to Israeli uh, evictions of Palestinian families in the Sheikh Jarrah uh, neighborhood. And according to a readout of the meeting, Biden underscored to Bennett the importance of steps to improve the lives of Palestinians and Biden noted the importance of refraining from actions that could exacerbate tensions, contribute to a sense of unfairness and undermine efforts to build trust. Those are code words for uh, uh, asking Israel to stop the expansion of settlements in the West Bank. So Biden is saying all the right things, um, but you know I don't see him um, uh, launching a new initiative to promote Israel-Palestine uh, talks, at least not for now. And you know, Israel and Palestine can do this you know, themselves. They already started uh, with this a meeting of defense, uh, of the defense minister with a Palestinian president. Um, and by the way, I noted uh, on Thursday, a Palestinian official uh, said that, uh, expressed opposition to any peace negotiations with Israel, uh, negotiations under the leadership of the United States. Now, I don't know where he got the idea that the United States was going, again, going to lead uh, peace negotiations uh, with Israel. Uh, it might happen in the term of the Biden administration, but I don't see it happening in, in the immediate future. Third uh, a question you posed to me, um, uh, Biden approach to um, Iran, Saudi uh, rapprochement, they're going to cheer. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, I, I think it's interesting. It shows the fact that these talks are happening shows that the United States doesn't need to be involved in everything. You know, parties can, can do things on their own. Um, I think we can give Biden some indirect credit for the fact that these talks took place because Biden's election and his desire to restore the JCPOA probably persuaded the Saudi leadership that they could no longer rely on Washington 
to support them at every turn. They had to take matters into their own hands. Um, the Biden administration certainly is pleased at these talks, but they're, they're being very low key about it. And, you know, rightfully so. Uh, when the talks became public, the State Department just said, yeah, we know about it. Um, <laughs> it's the goal of the United States uh, to de-escalate tensions and we feel all parties should, uh, should speak with each other. That would be positive. Um, but, uh, you know, the United States can't, can't say a lot more because it doesn't want to give any suggestion that Saudi Arabia is doing this at uh, U.S. behest. And uh, it's also conscious of the way that um, Iran uh, views uh, U.S. role. And by the way, if these talks actually amount to anything, and, you know, maybe they will, um, it, it's less reason for Biden to insist that um, restoring the JCPO also be linked to talks on regional issues, if the states can do it themselves. And so that leads me to the fourth, set, uh, fourth issue um, uh, approach to the JCPOA. Um, you know, I think it's uh, really unfortunate that Biden got off to such a slow start at the beginning of this year. He first needed to get his key um, nominees confirmed by the Senate, where the, you know, it, it's very, very uh, tight there. Um, and then the talks ran out of time under Rouhani, and now the new government is stalling. And it's not even clear they want to restore the JCPOA. It's really unfortunate they couldn't get it done um, under uh, Rouhani. And, and, and it's such a tragedy because the deal is, it's obvious, you know, what the deal should be. Um, it's almost all there. There are a few things where each side should make some compromises and just get it done. So I don't think the problem is that um, Raisi needs time to settle in. I think the issue is just that the Supreme Leader is not willing to make these compromises uh, that would be necessary. You know, he got to stop insisting that every sanction imposed under the Trump administration has to be lifted. I mean, some of them were imposed for very good reasons, had nothing to do with the JCPOA, and don't impede the JCPOA. Um, uh, and, you know, this idea that uh, have to have guarantees that the United States will never withdraw again. Well, Biden could do that for his term, but he can't, he can't um, bind a, a, a successor. Uh, um, that's not the way um, it works. Um, I think Biden could uh, expand on the sanctions that would be lifted. I think he can um, adjust um, this demand that there be um, follow-on talks on other issues. But having follow-on talks is important. He's not saying everything has to be resolved, but at least we'd like to talk about other things, and including how to improve upon the JCPOA in the future. Because there's a lot of uh, belief, a growing belief in Washington that uh, JCPOA in and of itself may not be worth uh, reviving. You know, there's not that much time left to it. And the way that Iran has broken uh, the limits, um, make it uh, very hard to um, get back to a one year breakout timeline, one year um, you know, before Iran could produce a nuclear weapon if they were to break out. I personally think that this one year timeline is a, is a very arbitrary figure. It doesn't have to be 12 months, it could be six months. As long as there is good verification, as long as there is um, an ability uh, to detect a uh, breakout. And, you know, it's worrisome that Iran is reducing the verification. Uh, this um, not um, allowing um, inspectors in to, um, uh, to check uh, the, um, you know, the, the, the cameras, uh, that's all very worrisome. And by the way, I think it should be clarified that Iran is not um, disallowing all inspections. This often gets um, uh, misstated in the media. Iran is complying with its safeguards agreements with the IAEA. What it's not complying with is any additional verification under the JCPOA. And, and when I say Iran is complying with its safeguards uh, agreements, actually it's not in, in one way, the way, the way that um, Ali mentioned this. These other unreported uh, locations where the IAEA found evidence of, of uranium, you know, Iran was doing something in those locations that they didn't report. And that's a violation of its safeguards agreement. So if there's no, uh, JC uh, POA restoration in the coming um, weeks, months. I think the Board of Governors is going to take a harder approach to this safeguards violations. And, you know, not in the uh, upcoming board, but maybe in November. I, you know, th there may be um, a, a majority on the board who say, yeah, you know, Iran is violating its safeguards agreements by not addressing these questions. And they're also, um, you know, not so happy about the, um, the diminution of the verification under the JCPOA. Um, I think that a, a, a safeguards uh, 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 non-compliance finding would be about the, the least uh, strict um, uh, option 
available to uh, the United States and its Western partners. Um, there are a, a lot of other harder options that they could take. Um, I was thinking to outline some of them, but I, when I did that in Twitter yesterday, I got so much pushback that maybe it's not pro so productive uh, to talk about those um, other, other hard options. But I think we all know what they are. Um, there are things that the United States and its partners could do that um, uh, would create leverage of their own. I'll stop there. <laughs>